When I was in third grade, we lived in Streeter, Illinois. My dad was a minister of the church there. And on top of the church, they built an apartment. Four room apartment, two bathrooms, dining room, living room, and a kitchen. And at that time, when I was in third grade, they had a missionary convention. J. Russell Morse had just returned from the communist prison camp that he'd been in for a while. And the stories he told upset me. As a third grader, I had a hard time with everything he said. And at the same time, <clears throat> being in third grade, I hated my teacher, and she hated me. And it just got really worse every day. And I ended up failing third grade. So I had to take third grade over again, which I didn't want to. I was humiliated, I was embarrassed, I was frustrated. My mother said, Paul, we're gonna start over from day one, and every day when you come home from school, we're gonna work on your homework together. And I said, but mother, well, you know how that goes. So she helped me with my homework every day. <clears throat> And about four weeks into school, we had a test, and I brought the test home, and there was a C on it. My mother was so excited that I'd got a C. She was thrilled, said, I knew you could do it. And just for that, tonight's supper, I'll give you whatever you'd like for supper, I'll fix it. And I remember what I said. I'd like a baked potato and ice cream. <laughs> so that was the supper she gave me. And then she said you could stay up a little later. What do you think she did for me? It spurred me on to want to do the best, for I never had trouble in school ever again. That's what encouragement does. It makes you want to move on when you feel like quitting. We need to encourage one another. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you four verses that have to do with encouraging one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 reads, Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18 reads, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. <clears throat> but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Every one of us can be great encouragers by developing these five qualities. One, encouragers demonstrate a real loving concern for people. Two, encouragers actively listen with empathy. They are good listeners. Three, encouragers see people as storehouses of untapped potential because they don't see you where you are, they see you where you're going to go. Four, encouragers see circumstances and conditions as changeable. They are prayerfully problem solvers and help you create solutions and positive change. They consistently deliver words of hope that support you to the very end. Five, encouragers set a positive example to follow. <clears throat> Every important race in life will bring us face to face with adversity, resistance, challenges. They kind of gang up on us with the hope of knocking us out of the race. I challenge you today to nurture the developed characters I just mentioned and encourage one another. None of us wants to be a source of discouragement, and yet if we're not careful, 
we can find ourselves being more pessimistic than optimistic. We can find ourselves being more discouraging than encouraging. Encouragement is vital for life and for relationships. Encouragement is like a cool breeze on a hot summer day. It revives, it refreshes. Encouragement helps you overcome when you feel overwhelmed. It helps you soar rather than sink. It helps you to be a victor rather than the victim. We all hunger and thirst for encouragement. I know I do, I'm sure you do too. When encouragement comes our way, we soak it up like a sponge. We're ready for more because that's what gets us through the day. If encouragement is that important, what can you and I do to make sure we're more positive than negative? If encouragement brings hope and strength and growth to people's lives, what can we do to make sure we're more encouraging than discouraging? God has placed in scripture a model for us to follow. The model is mentioned throughout the book of Acts. We're going to note some characteristics of that model to follow, to be an encourager. The encourager's name is Joseph. And the first place you find him is in Acts 4, verse 36. Acts 4, verse 36, it says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I'm going to talk about Barnabas today, but I want you to notice something. His real name is Joseph. His nickname is Barnabas, son of encouragement. Whenever they saw Joseph coming, the apostles would say, here comes Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Something about his life caused them to give him that nickname. Most of the time, nicknames point to the negative. When I was in high school, my nickname was Bonesy. Did I like it? No. But that's what my friends called me, Bonesy. It wasn't positive, it was negative. But when the disciples looked at Joseph, they said, here's Barnabas, son of encouragement. What was it about his life that made them give him that name? The first characteristic that shows us how much of an encouragement Barnabas was is found in Acts 4, verse 36 and 37. Acts 4, verse 36 and 37, Luke writes, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Joseph called Barnabas, sells a piece of land, gives the money to the church, and they distribute it to those who need it. Barnabas shows the first characteristic of an encourager. An encourager freely gives of his or her resources. Encouragers recognize what they have really doesn't belong to them, but it belongs to God. What God has given to them is basically there to meet the needs of those around them. Barnabas freely gave. If you want to encourage something or someone, do something tangible for them. As one person said, people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When we send money overseas, we call that support to our missionaries. It's basically encouragement, letting them know that we are behind them. When we give time or talent or resources, we encourage others. When we participate, when we're asked to do something, we encourage others by doing that. Encouragers give of their resources without expecting anything in return. Here's a second characteristic of an encourager. Evidence in the life of Barnabas. Encouragers accept you where you are. In Acts 9, we read about the conversion of Paul. Instead of being a persecutor, he becomes a promoter of the gospel. As a result, his life is in danger. In Acts 9, starting in verse 20, we read this. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus 
is the Christ. That's Acts chapter 9. Eventually the Jews conspired to kill Paul, but his followers took him at night and lowered him in a basket to an opening on the wall. Paul went to Jerusalem to join the disciples, but they were afraid. They couldn't believe he had now become a Christian. He once was Saul the prosecutor, now he's Paul the apostle. Put yourself in Paul's shoes. At one time this man was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now he's given all that up. He's proclaiming the gospel. People are coming to Christ. At the moment, Paul needs refuge in Jerusalem, the Christian Mecca, but he can't get in, and really his opponents had a point. They think about Paul's life, who oversaw the death of the first martyr of the church. As they were stoning Stephen to death, Saul stood there and held Stephen's jacket and watched it all. Paul in Acts 9 says that Saul began ravaging the church. The word ravage has an interesting word picture behind it. It's like a pig going into the field to root it up. Paul's sole purpose was to root up the church. Acts 9 says he breathed threats and murder against the disciples. I'd say they had good reason to be concerned about Paul. But notice who comes to the rescue. I will follow the word but in scripture because I always find contrast when the scripture begins with the word but. In Acts 9 verse 27, we see the contrast. Notice how the verse begins. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul in his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he'd preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Do you see the second characteristic of an encourager? Encouragers are willing to accept you where you are and help you get where you need to be. They're the kind of people who don't look at your reputation or your past. They have a wonderful ability to let the past be the past and start right fresh and start over. Encouragers realize that none of us come to Christ with an advantage. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All are new creations in Jesus Christ. And because of that, the encouragers can pick up anyone from where he is and help that person get where they need to be. Now think about Paul. We might not have half of the New Testament if Barnabas hadn't accepted him because Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Another characteristic of encouragers is that their major goal is to meet the need even when they're not the best ones to do it. An encourager is never out to make a name for himself, only to glorify the name of God. Barnabas knew that Paul had tremendous gifts and that the church needed to be fed. He pulled those two together. An encourager is a networker, always looking to see who can best fit the need and get the job done. The major goal is to get the needs met. Encouragers sit in the back seat, let somebody else drive. If that's what brings God's glory, we call it servant's mentality. There's one more quality of an encourager found in Acts 15, verse 36. In this passage, Paul and Barnabas have decided to go back and visit the churches. But there's a little problem. John Mark is the problem. Paul suggests to Barnabas that they visit the brethren in every city where they preached. Barnabas wants to take John Mark, but Paul keeps insisting they should not take him along because he deserted them in Pamphylia. The disagreement is so sharp that they separate. Barnabas takes Mark with him to Cyprus, and Paul chooses Silas, and they go their separate ways. Mark had deserted them on his first missionary journey. Some believe he left because he was intimidated about being a Jew in Gentile territory. Others believe there was a bit of leadership change from Barnabas to Paul. Early in the story, Barnabas is listed first, but over time, Paul takes top belly. And by the way, Mark is Barnabas' cousin, 
So maybe that's why he decides to leave. Regardless of the reason for Mark's abandonment, notice that it shows us another characteristic of an encourager. They're the kind of people who are willing to give you a second chance. They realize that one failure doesn't mean total failures. Try again, they say. That's exactly what Barnabas did for Mark. I find this interesting because Barnabas went on the first missionary journey with Paul. You would think that they had a pretty close relationship, but Barnabas goes to the mat for Mark. And he gave him another chance. That's encouraging. What we all need is encouragement of some kind. It's vital for life and for relationships. Let's follow the example of Barnabas and be an encourager to one another. And quit the negative complaining and criticizing. Encouragers give freely of their resources. What's an encourager? An encourager accepts you where you are and helps you get where you need to be. They don't lock you into your past mistakes. What's an encourager? Encouragers get excited about the progress of others. What's an encourager? Encouragers meet the current need, whatever the need is. Encouragers give people another chance. Let's go encourage one another. So now before I pray, I want you to say a word of encouragement to whoever's sitting closest to you. Go ahead, encourage that person. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you that you make us wise. You bring joy to our hearts and light to our eyes. And you know what we can become with just a little bit of encouragement. We thank you for what we've learned in this time we've spent together Thank you for teaching and leading us through the day and for the mutual encouragement we have received from each other just by being together. And guide us as we are returning encouragement to others as we go our separate ways. Amen, amen, amen. The aroma of Christ. We are about to share a symbolic meal together to commemorate the death of God's Son. But this isn't a funeral meal, it's a celebration. It seems strange to view the death of Jesus on the cross that way. But listen to how God viewed that sacrifice. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly beloved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, and sacrifice to God, that being Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. That's a striking description. Jesus gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Consider that his sacrifice was on a cross, which smelled like blood and grime, torture, and the Bible of humiliation, and yet it was fragrant to God. So obviously what pleased God about his son's sacrifice was not the actual combination of smells, but everything Jesus brought with him to the cross, obedience, humility, kindness, gentleness, and love. That is the aroma of Christ. What does, what does that mean for us as we commemorate Christ on the cross? It means that spreading the aroma of Christ may not smell very sweet to us. It may smell like dirty diapers as you sacrifice to take care of your children or other people's children. It may have the warm, stale smell of a nursing home when you take time to visit people that everyone else has forgotten. It may smell like the onions you cut for the pot of chili you serve to homeless people at a shelter. Wherever we sacrifice out of love, that's the aroma of Christ. All of it. That's what people will recognize as Jesus in us. A lot of that stinks, but to God, it smells wonderful. All right, take your communion cup.
Take the cracker and eat it, which represents Christ's body. Take the juice and drink it, which represents the blood of Christ. All right, let's pray. All right. Dear Heavenly Father God, I'd like to pray and say thank you for your son's sacrifice on the cross. What he did was not only a show of love and kindness, but it also goes to it go it goes to show his love and your love for us, God. You sacrificed your son, he sacrificed and he went through horrible things for our eternal salvation, God. Thank you for your love and your kindness that you showed towards us hopeless humans. But through Christ, we have eternal salvation and hope and love in your promise, God. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.